Okay. Fantastic. Well, I'm excited to uh, see everybody today and um, the critical care side of me is excited because I think a lot of you have ER or critical care uh, bent to what you do or what you are doing. And so um, particularly when it comes to COVID-19, um, we will take that approach. So that's fun for me because I like talking about a little bit about critical care medicine here. Um, so a little bit of a departure from our normal project echo um, focus in cardiology clinic, uh, but I think a very important one um, um, in this time. So caveat before we get started, I have not yet treated any patients with active COVID-19 or cardiovascular complications, um, and I'm thankful for that. I think we are lucky in this area so far. Um, but this is very important to know the emerging data that's coming out about COVID-19 and how this virus can affect the heart, because anybody who is in ER, inpatient setting, um, or really we're all going to know people who are suffering from this and so i think understanding a bit about how it can impact the heart is important so all the data i'm going to show you is really emerging most of it is coming out of the experience in china we're getting a little bit of data published from italy but not a ton yet and we will expect to see more as um, sort of places in the u.s are hit and we're able to gather some of this information um, so that's important to note because we are seeing slightly different patterns in the US than what we saw, at least the data that we saw come out of China. So everything is gonna be a bit with an asterisk, particularly the numbers, but I think it's really the pathophysiology that's an important thing to note here. Um, so you can go to the next slide, please, Troy. Um, so what we're gonna talk about is the cardiovascular diseases and risk factors that portend increased risk to patients who do contract the disease the cardiovascular complications of infection itself. We're gonna talk about the renin angiotensin aldosterone system inhibitors. All the fourth year med students are quaking as they reach into the backs of their brains to remember that. <laughs> uh, but this is something that's very much a hot topic in the cardiology community right now. Um, we're also gonna talk a touch on the cardiovascular complications of some of the treatments you may have heard about. Um, and then because CPR happens to be my area of expertise and my main interest, I will touch on CPR. Next slide, please. So we're gonna go through one of the cases that's been reported in the literature that seems to be representative of one of the extreme cardiovascular complications of COVID-19. Um, this makes me shudder, a 37-year-old man. That number is a lot younger than what I would like it to be <laughs> for my own sake. Uh, but 37-year-old uh, was admitted to the hospital. This was in China, although reports from Italy have been similar. Three days of dyspnea and chest pain and diarrhea. <clears throat> he was hypotensive on admission, 80 over 50. Um, they measure troponin T levels in this hospital, different than what we measure in the US, but it's greater than the upper limit here. So you can extrapolate that the troponin level is extremely high. And then although the units are different, the BNP, brain natriuretic peptide level, is also extremely high in this patient. Um, so I think that's a, a typical workup that people might do for someone who has dyspnea and chest pain. Remembering that one of the challenges in this time is that when a patient comes to see you in the ER, or you're seeing a patient in the hospital, all the other diseases that happen still happen. So MI still happen, PE is still happen, and differentiating, making a diagnosis when we are constantly having COVID on our mind is a bit of a challenge. Um, anybody have any thoughts of something else they'd like to do diagnostically for this patient, other questions they might have before I move on to some of the other data? D-dimer. EKG. Okay, uh, I'll... Sh I'll show EKG and D-dimer uh, not mentioned in the case report. Absolutely an important test to get here. I have someone on the chat saying, everybody wants an EKG, you shall get one. Other thoughts? Uh, how about any thoughts on what's on your differential at this point? 37, remember. So we can use that to help us at least with our other diseases that we know a lot about. Chest x-ray, I will also show you a chest x-ray. Great. So based on D-dimer, we've thinking about PE, I think that's appropriate in a 37 year old. We don't know much about their mobility or travel history. EKG, so people are getting towards ischemia. Pericarditis, all very good in a 37 year old. I think people are more worried about pericarditis than they are about ischemia. Heart failure exacerbation listed here, absolutely. Uh, this person may have an undiagnosed cardiomyopathy or they might have that, we haven't gotten to their history yet. 
uh, HOCAM, hypertrophic, uh, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. So yes, in an extreme circumstance, this could be an exacerbation of HOCAM. Usually though, those people are gonna be presenting with syncope as their main complaint, and less this hypotensive shock picture. Uh, we got viral myocarditis, thank you very much. You know where we're going with this, but I think that's really important to recognize uh, the pattern here. Anything else anybody wants to type in? And in fact, I think this, this uh, typing is working well uh, because we have so many participants here. So I think that's a great way for us to continue when I'm posing questions to the group. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, next slide. Okay, so as asked, I'm going to take you through at least the images provided in this case report, and apologies that some of them are small. Um, so A is the chest x-ray on presentation. Uh, what I'm going to point out here is a couple of things. First of all, of course, as a cardiologist, I'm looking at the heart, but let's look at the lungs since we are talking about, the, uh, you know, a person presenting with dyspnea in the time of COVID. You'll note that we don't have a lot of markings in the upper lung fields. I mean, you might be able to say there's some vascular pattern, but this is not lungs of ARDS by any stretch. I do notice here some very plump, hyalur vascular congestion here. Um, so that catches my eye thinking more about pulmonary edema than about a focal infiltrate. And then this is the other thing I'm noticing. This cardiac silhouette is massive. So this is a very large cardiac silhouette. Sometimes that can be because they're not a fully expanded chest x-ray if the x-ray is taken during expiration instead of inspiration. But if I count the ribs, there's approximately M8 showing, which is a decent x-ray. So this seems much too large for a 37-year-old man. Um, in panel B and C, you're going to see his chest CT. Uh, of course, I think that's an important diagnostic test, both when thinking about uh, COVID-19. In fact, in China, people started using the CT on chest pattern to make the diagnosis without actually confirmatory testing, but also important for some of the other things mentioned, in particular for PE, although we don't see contrast in these phases of the CT scan, we're on the lung windows. Um, so importantly, what we see here is, again, we don't have that um, ground glass and diffuse pattern of ARDS. We do have plump vasculature. The pulmonary arteries do seem to be enlarged. And then here we also see um, a right-sided pleural effusion. So this pattern, important when we're trying to differentiate the causes of dyspnea in this uh, young man. F is uh, his chest x-ray after treatment, which we'll go through. And then if you look here, if everyone can see, they are small. But in panel E is the um, EKG that everyone was asking for. Um, thank you. And um, this is in a slightly different pattern than what you might be accustomed to. So this is one, two, three, um, AVF, AVL, AVR, and then V1 through V6 on the right-hand side. Any comments on this EKG and how does it sway your diagnostic uh, thoughts that you shared earlier? Anybody calling the cath lab? You can share your thoughts on the chat if anyone wants to be so brave. Okay, so I'll share what I see. There are definitely ST elevations present. This is by no means a normal EKG, particularly for a 37-year-old. So I see a ST elevation in lead three in particular. So I wanna also look in two and AVF. Okay, so we have some comments coming in here. So three is elevated. So if I'm looking for inferior territory, I look in two, which does not look elevated. And I'm seeing uh, AVF is at the bottom. So really not also much by way of elevation. So maybe an isolated elevation in lead three. But then I do definitely see more ST elevations in V1, V2. So that's more in that anteroseptal territory. And then I have ST depressions throughout the lateral, uh, anterolateral leads here in V2 through V6. So this pattern could absolutely be concerning for anterior MI. It doesn't quite fit though that three is elevated inferiorly with V1 and V2, that's not a typical pattern. So we see not quite diffuse ST elevations, but a lot of ST elevations. <laughs> And then also someone appropriately mentioned that the QRS appears to be widened, and that is correct. We don't have um, ability to see all of the small boxes, but this is a wider QRS than what you expect, again, in, in a normal 37-year-old. So this is a concerning EKG. Um, if you weren't in the time of, of COVID-19, you may absolutely consider uh, calling cardiology and or the cath lab for this, mostly because V1 and V2 are elevated, and this is of concern. You probably want to get some expert consultation.
Um, but when we take together this whole picture, I think we're more thinking about that um, myopericarditis is the terminology I'm going to use. I say myopericarditis in particular because we already know that muscle is involved because our troponin is elevated. Pericarditis alone, if it's just inflammation of the lining of the heart, does not necessarily give us troponin elevation. So to be specific, I say myopericarditis when I believe that the inflammatory process in the pericardium um, is causing inflammation in the myocardium. Now, at the same time, we really don't know in this instance, is this just myocarditis or is the pericardium also involved? We don't have an MRI that would help us differentiate that. And honestly, it doesn't really matter. We believe that we have these EKG changes, we have troponin elevation, and we have a clinical syndrome. So we're saying that the heart muscle is inflamed. And then panel D is gonna be his EKG after treatment, which you can see now you feel much more comfortable. <laughs> this is a much better looking EKG, particularly for a 37 year old, more in the lines of what we would expect. Not completely normal. Um, there is um, still some ST elevation in V1 as well as inferiorly in three, but it has resolved completely. Um, okay, endocarditis is also being brought up as a possibility. Um, yes, I think, again, depending upon where you practice, your patient population, we don't know much about this guy. Does he have an indwelling dialysis catheter? Is this someone who uses IV drugs? Those things could raise endocarditis as a suspicion, but you would not see these kind of EKG changes with endocarditis alone, inflammation of the valve. In fact, the only EKG changes you might see would be changes in your PR interval if you have aortic valve endocarditis, which is eating towards the AV node and delaying conduction, but you would not expect ST elevations in the setting of endocarditis. Great questions. Any other comments or thoughts on these studies before we move on to the rest of his clinical course? Okay, great, next slide. Um, so, of course, an echo is obtained, most important test that we can get, and he has an ejection fraction of 27%, not normal, and an enlarged LV. As always is the case, this is a snapshot in time, and so you're trying to figure out, is this an acute drop in his LV function? Do we think that this is an exacerbation of an underlying familial cardiomyopathy, for example? But all you know for right now is that he definitely has um, decreased LV systolic function. Now, as other people had mentioned and considered, um, ischemia has to be on our list. Um, in this instance, he is not taken to the cath lab. I will tell you that that appears to be the um, consensus and the practice pattern happening in the time of COVID-19. Um, we are really leaning away from cath lab, if at all possible. And so we're trying to use alternative modalities to evaluate these patients. So particularly in a 37-year-old who is young and your suspicion for a plaque rupture, myocardial infarction is low, they chose coronary CT angiography. Not every place has that availability. They happen to have it. This is just simply a way of non-invasively doing angiography and looking at the arteries. And in this case for him, it was sufficient to rule out stenosis, and so we spare him an invasive procedure and we spare all of the people potential exposure. Of course, viral panel is obtained. Important to remember here, we don't wanna forget about other viruses in the setting of being so obsessed with coronavirus. So in addition to sending the coronavirus test, they also sent influenza, Coxsackie, all of the other potential um, respiratory viruses, but also ones that can cause myocarditis and everything else negative in his case, except for coronavirus. Uh, here's where things get interesting and controversial. So he is treated with the full range of treatments. This is a young guy, he is hypotensive, he's in cardiogenic shock, um, and therefore he was treated as such. <clears throat> and so I'll answer that question about um, being diabetic in, uh, in a moment. Um, Actually, I'll answer that now. So a great question posed by Nikki, uh, her, Nick Hershey, um, asking if the patient was diabetic, would that change the approach? Um, so you're getting at the fact that even a 37-year-old, particularly with longstanding diabetes, is absolutely at risk for significant coronary artery disease and MI. I've seen it. I've treated it many times. Um, I, I usually use a 10-year history of diabetes in a 37-year-old as one is my cutoff to say, um, how at risk is this person? So say he was diagnosed with insulin 
um, resistance two years ago, that's not going to be enough of diabetes for me to worry about coronary disease in this particular instance. Um, if he was a longstanding type 1 diabetic, especially poorly controlled, that may push me towards thinking about ischemia. Um, but as I'll mention um, later, we, in fact, the, all the cardiology professional societies have suggested that we not go to the cath lab if at all possible and to use lytics for ST elevation MIs. So we are hearkening back to um, some days before we had easy access to percutaneous intervention. And if the diagnosis is certain as STEMI, the recommendation is lytics. For NSTEMI, the recommendation is medical management, and then select cases going to the cath lab. Now there's a challenge about lytics, particularly in a case like this. If you are treating either pericarditis or myocarditis, you absolutely should not be giving thrombolytics. Um, that is because the propensity to bleed is high when you have an inflammatory situation in the pericardium or the myocardium. Um, so here, I think that you would use the fact that the EKG pattern of ST elevation is not consistent with anterior STEMI. You would also use your echo, which shows global hypokinesis and not a focal area in the anterior wall, combined with um, the rest of his um, labs, which I haven't shown you, they did not provide, but I'm sure we could see the leukopenia that we are seeing in COVID-19 cases. And you would make a clinical judgment here um, to say that this is myocarditis. You can also use the trend of the troponins, but this is going to be a diagnostic challenge in your 65-year-old patient, more so than in your 37-year-old patient. Okay, that's a great question about diabetes. Okay, and then we're gonna get down to these treatments, which other people are asking some uh, very smart thoughts about. So I think, again, one of the challenges in this time is that we have to continue the treatments that we know are appropriate for diseases and modify those as we get more information about how this particular disease responds. So when someone's in cardiogenic shock, we often give them an inotrope. So this person is put on milrinone. There is absolutely risk associated with milrinone in the setting of myocarditis. Milrinone is arrhythmogenic. So it's going to increase the potential for having arrhythmia, which you're already at very high risk for when you have a soggy myocardium. That said, milrinone is going to be a better choice than dobutamine here because it's going to be less arrhythmogenic. So they chose that. He was so hypotensive that he also needed norepinephrine to support his blood pressure. This might look counterintuitive, but this is a pretty common combination in the setting of cardiogenic shock. Diuretics, because he was in some degree of heart failure here. Now, these are absolutely controversial treatments, as people have pointed out. Um, so he was given high dose steroids and immunoglobulin both. Remember that this is in the early days in China before we really had a lot of communication or professional societies giving us recommendations. Currently, steroids are not recommended, part, at least for the lung part of things. Steroids in the setting of myocarditis, just any myocarditis, are also controversial. Um, we tend to uh, treat with supportive care and watch for recovery as opposed to actually immunosuppressing these patients, with the exception of giant cell myocarditis, which is the one type that we do treat with steroids and tends to respond. So this is a controversial treatment even for any type of myocarditis, but there are times someone is young and you throw the book at them because we do not have any randomized controlled trials looking at steroids in the setting of myocarditis, we just have expert opinion. Immunoglobulin, so this is non-specific pooled immunoglobulin here, just trying to provide him some kind of antibodies to um, soak up the virus more or less. Uh, also controversial, but given in this instance. Um, okay, a comment here was about um, milrinone over dibutamine from Dr. Lavi. I think I answered that one um, there. So he's given a lot of stuff. Now there are other case reports circulating around that I've read where people actually are going on to mechanical circulatory support, including ECMO. Um, this is, these are challenging decisions to make even when we aren't in the midst of a resource stretching time where critical care is you know, being stretched or going to be stretched. Um, but that uh, those choices are being made in certain circumstances. I think how young this patient is is uh, one of the driving factors probably pushing them to be incredibly aggressive here. 
okay, ECMO was just asked about. So yes, again, there are only case reports that I've seen circulating, um, but people have done it if they're in a center where they are have ECMO capability. Um, Plasma is also brought up here as a potential therapy with convalescent antibodies. I know Mount Sinai in New York is um, starting to harvest donor plasma from uh, people who have recovered from COVID-19 and using that as therapy. I have not seen any reports of it being used particularly in a myocarditis patient, but the principle would be the same as for someone with serious lung injury. Um, so I think that is a therapy people are considering. Of course, scalability is a problem there. I have no idea who the donors are. I'm assuming they're healthcare workers, right? Because aren't we all just the ones in the, in the line of fire here? Um, but that is something people are actively looking into. <laughs> yeah, so uh, Nick Hirsch saying, usually it's healthcare workers, yeah. <clears throat> so I think in large centers, people are doing a lot of studies on this and they have more resources. In smaller centers, even in the hospital I'm working in now, we would not have access to ECMO. We would have access to some of our other mechanical circulatory support, but I think if you are at that point and you're in a place where you don't have the you know, full complement of a quaternary care center, then you're dealing with discussions about transferring the patient, particularly the young patient. And again, in a time of resources being stretched, that is becoming a challenge. Um, the, uh, I trained at Johns Hopkins and many of my friends are still there. And I know that when they're receiving some phone calls to transfer, they, they received a phone call, for example, from a cruise ship, someone who had had a cardiac arrest and asking to transfer the patient. And the suspicion on the part of the receiving doctors at Hopkins was that it was probably COVID-19 induced myocarditis. And um, they said no, because the potential for recovery for the patient was low. In addition, there are immunocompromised patients spread everywhere throughout that hospital. So these are going to be very difficult decisions between sending and accepting physicians. And I think our normal um, ways of functioning where the quaternary care center pretty much always says yes for the critically ill, especially young patient, that might not be the case going forward. Um, other thoughts, comments, questions about this treatment regimen, um, and I'll, I'll go into a little bit more about the myocarditis pattern in the following slides. Could, hey, Dr. Top, Morning, Hi, Hey. Uh, could you comment on any of the, like the hydroxychloroquine or the other kind of protease inhibitors and how much they might interact with the medicines you have up on here, or um, if that's kind of, unless you're going to talk about it later. Um, yes, I will talk about the potential treatments outside of the myocarditis case in particular. I'll also talk about ACE inhibition. The only thing in terms of interactions on this list here um, is going to be um, that we would stop ACE inhibitors when someone's in cardiogenic shock for obvious reasons. But hydroxychloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, chloroquine, um, those things, of course, are QT prolonging agents. So we would have to watch the QT. Milrone in and of itself, not typically a QT prolonging agent, but all the things people are sedated with also can prolong the QT. So that's going to be the main thing, but no potential interactions otherwise on this list. Thank you. And we will get into those as well. Yeah, thanks. Okay, next slide, please. So this is not a, a short process. So in one week of being in the ICU, um, there was a significant decrease in the troponin. We'll talk a little bit about that trend, but usually with myocarditis, we see that the troponin is relatively steady because you have ongoing inflammation. So when I said you could use a troponin trend to differentiate between acute ischemia and ongoing inflammation, of course, you need multiple time points, and in the setting of ST elevations, we don't often have that luxury. But acute ischemia is a bam, one-time event. You have a thrombus, you get the injury to the myocardium, and it's done. So we see a rise and a fall in our cardiac biomarkers. Myocarditis is an ongoing inflammatory process, so you have this constant relatively constant elevation in the troponin level. So those trends are very helpful when making a diagnosis. For this young man, um, the troponin started to decrease, but not for a week. And I can tell you as a critical care cardiologist, that's hard to watch and to have someone on inotropes for a week, not improving and not knowing if my therapies are doing anything at all to treat his underlying disease. Um, in many of the other myocarditis, myocarditis, I guess, that we treat, 
um, particularly giant cell, which I mentioned, this is a rapid decline. We're talking 48 hours between feeling normal and being on ECMO in the ICU, but they also tend to recover fairly quickly. We're still learning about what the time course is for myocarditis and COVID-19. And then three weeks later, he had a normal ejection fraction and his LV had recovered to a normal size three weeks. So he is lucky in one sense, unlucky in another sense, but I think highlighting this time course and the patients required, patients with a C, <laughs> this is again a challenge when your ICUs are overwhelmed. And if he were 77 or 87 instead of 37, would that change the approach to how long physicians are willing to keep him on inotropes and say there is still hope for some recovery? Again, I think those are going to be very challenging questions that we're forced to face. Um, question from Clint, did they just do another echo after three weeks or were they routinely following with echo? Typically we do routinely follow them with echo. Even if it's not a formal echo, we would put a probe on at the bedside and take a quick look ourselves. Um, in the purpose of the case report, I think they were just showing that it was three weeks until they saw the recovery of ejection fraction. Good. Okay. Next um, slide, please. I love all the questions. I thought we weren't going to have enough material to last us until 1 p.m., but we will. So let me race through some of these other things. Um, so these are the questions that we're going to answer. Whenever I say COVID-19 patients, I'm also usually referring to persons under investigation because we're thinking about how do we approach anyone that we presume has or may have COVID-19. Um, okay, next um, uh, question. Oh, so before we go on, actually, uh, Amy asked a great question. So what about viral induced hemoglobinopathy? And can we comment on this with COVID and microthrombi in circulation? Absolutely fantastic questions that nobody knows the answer to. There are circulating papers out there supposing or theorizing that COVID-19 is more like altitude sickness and thinking about hemoglobin becoming non-functional in the setting of altitude um, and basically failure of oxygen delivery as opposed to true ARDS. This is all theoretical. We don't have any data behind it there. Um, so I think that is a, a, a very strong thought about the hemoglobinopathy question. People are even looking into acetazolamide as a treatment. That's all on the lung side. In the cardiac side, we really don't know. And then in terms of microthrombi in the circulation, again, no reports that we have yet of that pathophysiology, but what we know is that COVID-19 in these severe circumstances is inducing a sepsis-like state. And every sepsis-like state final common pathway does have some sort of hypercoagulability um, and microthrombi as part of its pathophysiology. So that would be expected, but has not yet been reported or proven. Okay. Another great question, can we attribute all these cases, and I presume we're gonna, you're speaking about myocarditis cases, or that's what I'll take the question to mean. Can we attribute all of them to COVID-19, or do we think COVID-19 might tip patients over the edge with pre-existing comorbidities? Yeah, great question. Certainly people with comorbidities are more at risk to have severe COVID-19 symptoms. Um, so I think that is within the realm of what you're discussing. In terms of the myocarditis though, that is an acute one-time event. It is the actual um, virus itself attacking the myocardial cells. So that certainly is going to be COVID-19 induced myocarditis. Okay, so let's go on to next slide please and we'll try to race through some of these questions. Okay, so how does the presence of cardiovascular disease impact patient risk? I think you're all aware of this, but just to go through, um, what we've seen is that there is a higher prevalence of risk factors in those infected than the general public. Okay, and we're talking about diabetes, hypertension, coronary artery disease, heart failure, um, uh, and COPD in particular. Um, there's an even higher prevalence of these risk factors or diseases in patients who get severe infection, so end up in the ICU or don't survive. So as you take the general population and then you get people who get COVID-19 and then you get those with severe COVID-19, your prevalence of cardiovascular disease goes up. So it certainly is a marker for increased risk. There's also higher case fatality. Um, this was actually surprising to me because if you just asked me to rank which disease is gonna give you a higher risk for mortality with COVID-19, I would say COPD, right? I would choose a lung disease because that's what we're hearing about. Turns out that cardiovascular disease, meaning 
heart failure, uh, heart failure, coronary disease, or MI, that's the highest case fatality rate, at least in China. Diabetes higher than COPD, higher than hypertension. But these case fatality rates are certainly higher than the general population. Again, numbers, we've all heard the reports that the number of the denominator in China is probably incorrect. The denominator in the US, by the way, is also incorrect. So we don't actually know the case fatality rates, but the important is that these are magnitudes of order higher than for people without these risk factors. Next slide, please. Okay, so what happened to the heart? We kind of mentioned this in the case, but to go through what we know a little bit. So cardiac injury, as defined by EKG changes or, um, in this report, a high sensitivity troponin elevation. I hate high sensitivity troponin, it's too sensitive, <laughs> but that's what's being measured. So any sort of cardiac injury is reported in 7.2% of overall cases in that grouped case report coming out of China, 22% of those who are required ICU stay. So it is common, you are going to see this. If you measure a troponin in an ICU patient with COVID-19, chances are it's going to be positive. And this is the case even if there's no underlying cardiovascular disease. So even though those patients are at higher risk, this 37-year-old with no cardiovascular disease still is having cardiac injury. We also know that there is worse mortality if you have cardiac injury as opposed to just the lung injury. Maybe even as high as 50%. I, I really have a hard time believing that number, but certainly higher mortality. Myocarditis with cardiogenic shock has a very high mortality in and of itself, so this is not a surprise. But in, it's a question of how they're defining the extent of cardiac injury here to get that worsened mortality. But as is the case with sepsis of any sort in the ICU, if you have a positive troponin, that gives you a worse outcome. This is the important thing I wanted to get to about the patterns. So we're seeing two different patterns emerge of the myocardial injury and the troponin elevation. So we're seeing what we think is due to inflammation or cytokine storm, and that's where you watch the troponin rise during the course of disease, similar to the septic patient. They're getting more sepsis, higher pressure doses, the troponin is going up as they become sicker. We think that's due to sort of bystander inflammation from the sepsis, as opposed to direct myocardial infection from the virus. But then the second pattern is, as we described in this case, fulminant or full-blown myocarditis with myocardial dysfunction, and that is the presenting illness in many of those patients as opposed to any lung pathology, which was the case in this gentleman, right? His dyspnea was not because of lung infiltrates. His dyspnea was because of his heart failure and myocarditis. So those two patterns are important. Thanks, Trey. Next slide is great. Um, so you may have heard this or seen this, but one of the few things we know about the pathophysiology of this is that um, the attachment of the SARS-CoV-19 virus is through the ACE enzyme, ACE2. And again, if you think back to remembering, learning about the running angiotensin aldosterone system, uh, this is what we are inhibiting with many of our drugs. So the question that was immediately raised, especially for cardiologists, because all of our patients are on these drugs, but you know what? All of your patients are on these drugs too. Do we stop these, these drugs? So next slide will tell you what the expert consensus is. Um, the current recommendation is that um, do not change what you're doing with their RAS inhibition. Just leave it as is. So if someone who's a person of interest or a person under investigation or a COVID-19 patient is already on an ACE inhibitor, an ARB, just leave it because that is the homeostasis of their body. And we really don't know if taking that away is going to do any good in the setting of COVID infection. If they are not on one of those drugs, don't start it thinking that somehow if you saturate the receptor, the virus won't get in. We don't have any evidence for that at this point. So therefore, you only stop the drugs if they have, as Daniel Dees is mentioning, hypotension. So if you have another reason to stop the drug, acute kidney injury, as all the septic patients get, hypotension, then we would stop the drug. But if you have an outpatient who's tested positive and they're on lisinopril, they're on losartan, just keep it going. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, great. Uh, I get an email about this like once a day from the professional society, so everybody's thinking about it. Next slide, please. Okay, so as Dr. Lavi mentioned, um, the cardiovascular risk with some of the COVID-19 treatments. 
Um, so political statements aside about whether these have been endorsed or not, <laughs> I know that in Nevada, we are being encouraged that I think um, both, I think hydroxychloroquine is now a, a controlled substance that we're not allowed to prescribe unless we have good reason to. Um, so they're looking at the concern that people are going to um, uh, hoard these things. Um, Sorry, let me go back um, to some of these comments to address them just about the ACE inhibition. Um, so from uh, Nick Hershey, uh, sharing the very astute evidence that COVID attaches 10 to 20 times stronger to the ACE receptor than the um, SARS virus from 2002, 2003. Um, yes, yeah, so that is, again, of concern, and people are trying to look at what to do with that, um, but we don't know how to translate that information into practice at this moment in time. A, another great question, how about newly diagnosed hypertension? Should we refrain from prescribing ACE or ARBs at this time? Yeah, great question. So I think uh, no professional society has said that yet. If you have a compelling indication otherwise for ACE or ARB, someone with diabetes in particular, I would absolutely still use these. Um, unless they have active COVID-19 infection, then you wanna wait until they're through the infection and then start them on that drug. But we have a lot of choices for antihypertensives. And so you can use your other um, medications of choice if you don't have a compelling secondary reason to give an ACE or ARB. Uh, but there is no current guideline or recommendation from a professional society about not using those drugs um, for newly diagnosed hypertension. Okay. And so then another question about what do you recommend based on the affinity of ARBs to the ACE receptor, will we switch ARBs to ACE inhibitor? And again, no recommendation for that. I think this is one of those times when we have some piece of science and then we're trying to extrapolate to how do we make sense of that in practice. But as we all know, oftentimes even treatments that make total sense pathophysiologically don't turn out to have the effect we want in clinical trials. So because we have no evidence, they're just saying stay the course with what you have unless there is a compelling indication to switch. I don't anticipate that's going to change because of all the questions that are being asked about COVID-19 and researched. This one is kind of low on the totem pole. We're trying more to get at treatment modalities at this point in time. So I don't know if we'll ever have a study that tells us this until we have pooled data from thousands of people, which will be a year or two from now. Okay, so moving on to these potential treatments. So both azithromycin and hydroxychloroquine have been suggested as possible treatments. Again, um, caution to remember that they have not been proven. There are very strong flaws in the studies that have been reported so far. Um, and so all expert infectious disease people are calling for more studies and not necessarily recommending treatment with this. So the deal here is hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin both prolong your QTC interval. However, hydroxychloroquine, we don't think that that QTC prolongation causes excess mortality. This drug is, you know, old as dirt has been prescribed to so many people over time, and it doesn't look like there's a mortality signal because not all QT prolongations lead to arrhythmia. But azithromycin, there is an excess risk of torsade and therefore cardiac arrest. So azithromycin, may have that increased risk. And if you're especially dealing with someone who may already have some underlying cardiovascular disease, um, I would avoid that one. The recommendations are that if you are going to start either of these drugs, it is highly preferred it's in the inpatient setting where you can have them on cardiac monitoring and you can measure EKGs to look for QT prolongation. <clears throat> there are, it is allowable to start them in the outpatient setting that that has been acknowledged but the preference is that you do get an ekg after starting it or you know their baseline ekg and that they are low risk there's actually calculators that you can look at and look up to calculate the risk of qt prolongation based on other risk factors other drugs and so if they have a high score then it's recommended you do not start the azithromycin on those patients um, so in this reference I've given you, um, there are links to um, some of those um, uh, recommendations there. But the bottom line here is that we don't even know if these things work. We need some monitoring to do it. So I anticipate that people will try it. And especially in the ICU setting, they're going to be trying this. And we'll get some more data as time goes on. Personally, my practice pattern would be in the ICU. I would not be opposed to trying this. 
um, with an appropriate discussion with patient and family about the unknown. Okay. Um, great. So just a few more comments to go back on to this. Um, Okay, so going back to the ACE inhibitors. If blood pressure changes objectively, do you have a, an, um, then do you have a clinical reason to switch to an ACE inhibitor? Um, okay, so are you talking about like if you're up titrating medication perhaps, and then you have a reason to switch to the ACE inhibitor? Yeah, I think, um, I think the basic point here is if there's active COVID-19 infection, stay away from these drugs if they're not already on them. Leave them be if they're already on them outside of that active infection time, then I think you can do what you will. Um, and so it's kind of like how we treat beta blockers and decompensated heart failure, where you just kind of leave everything where it is until things get better, and then you can go on to do your evidence-based titration. Okay, and then thanks, Terry Hunter has shared um, an article with us in the comments if anybody wants to read about social distancing, ACE2 receptors, protease inhibitors, and um, some other thoughts about this. Great, next slide, please. All right, so moving on to CPR, because many of you are ER and acute care, uh, and this CPR happens to be my area of research interest, so I get a lot of these uh, updates from professional societies and even questions from my former employer asking what should we be doing, what are the guidelines we should be putting in place. So a big concern for COVID-19 patients, persons under investigation, is any procedure that generates aerosol. So you've probably heard this, even non-invasive positive pressure ventilation like BiPAP or CPAP spreads and aerosolizes throughout the room. So we are, they are not recommending it at that time. Um, I know things like endoscopies are being canceled because that can aerosolize things. And it seems to be of concern that oral ENT surgeries of that sort are very high risk to infect everyone in the room because of that potential to generate aerosols. So um, ventilation during CPR is considered an aerosol generating procedure. So the official recommendations put out through AHA, American Heart Association, as well as ILCOR, the International Liaison Committee on Resuscitation, is that in the lay person setting, you continue compression only CPR, which is what we recommend anyway, at least in America, that's our guidelines. So don't even worry about that. I can't even imagine that a bystander would do artificial respirations on a patient in today's day and age. You can't do compressions from six feet away, it turns out, you cannot. Um, but anyway, so lay person, compression only. In the hospital, it is recommended that you only do CPR in an airborne isolation room. So that's easy for those of you in the ER who have patients rolling in, right? <laughs> so I don't know, wheel them to an airborne isolation room before you start CPR, that is completely counter to what we know about starting CPR early, but that's the recommendation. Everyone in the room should have on their personal protective equipment because this is going to be up close and personal, and so there is gonna be high risk for all the providers. This is the most important part, I think. No bag mask ventilation recommended. This is going to be very hard for people to follow because bagging during CPR, the airway, everyone gets overly worked up about airway. Uh, we don't even need to intubate during initial cardiac arrest, but that's a separate talk for a separate day. <laughs> but as you all know, you've worked in the hospital and ER and uh, EMS, everyone is freaking out about the airway. So no bag masking because that's going to generate aerosol. The only, only thing for airway here is rapid sequence intubation. If I were running the cardiac arrest scenario as the provider in charge, I would not ventilate at all. I would do the chest compressions, I would shock if need be, and I would not worry about the airway until we see where we're going. If we are getting return of circulation, that's gonna be an appropriate time to worry about the airway. But all the data we know shows that the compressions and the shock are far and away more important than the airway. So personally, that's how I would approach this. If someone's coming and going, I think that's appropriate to then do the airway, but I would give this some time. If after 15 minutes you've never gotten the pulse back, I'm not going to be putting someone at risk by making them stand up at the airway and do this intubation. And then finally, I think uh, a very important thing, particularly for medical students, people practicing in academic centers, you need to minimize the number of providers. Ha, easier said than done. In my former job, I shall not name the hospital, 
but I counted and there were usually 18 people in the room and another 20 standing outside the room. Um, that is not appropriate in this situation. It needs to be the fewest number of people possible. For me, five people is more than enough to accomplish this. Really with three, especially because no one needs to worry about the airway, three people should be sufficient. I wanna say, before I get to the comment, this is thinking about adults. Children is a different situation because for children, usually a cardiac arrest is precipitated by a respiratory event. In adults, it is most often, not most often, but very often from a cardiac event. So children, the airway is far more important. So I'm not even touching on kids here because I stay as far away from sick kids as possible. Thankfully, kids seem to not be uh, getting infected or symptomatic very much with COVID-19. So that hasn't come up in the literature that I've seen. Um, okay, so that's the, a bit on CPR. Um, some new points here. Okay, um, so two questions. I'm gonna do the CPR question first and then we'll go back to the ACE inhibitor question. I'm glad that's generated so much discussion. The CPR question, what is recommendation for pre-hospital setting first responders? Yeah, I did not include all those recommendations here. So um, they basically say, try to keep the back of the ambulance open. So that's easy. Um, because you want to have, you know, as much air flowing as possible. Um, they do allow for airway management from first responders, um, but again, minimizing the bag mask. So I think something more like a mask airway, but I did not read in particular if they mentioned the particular type of airway. Um, but essentially the goal is provide chest compressions and try to be as safe as possible on your way to the hospital. Um, they did not say don't do any airway management for first responders. They basically said, be careful about your airway management. Um, and every EMS system approaches this differently depending upon who's on the rig and what their um, level of expertise is. Again, if I were an EMS medical director, I would say if someone has intubation ability, then we can consider that in the field, but I would focus highly on shocks and chest compressions until they're getting to the hospital. I think the, this is a big challenge for first responders because you don't have the luxury of talking to the patient and knowing if they are at risk for COVID-19. So you have to assume everybody is uh, potentially carrying this around. So this is very challenging. Um, and then similarly, you don't have the, re the benefit of a negative pressure room. Um, so I really, my heart is with the first responders who are truly out in the line of fire. Um, also, a lot of these patients are presenting, unfortunately, with cardiac arrest as the presenting complaint. And so it's certainly possible that the cardiac arrest is from COVID-19 myocarditis, but you won't have the luxury of knowing that when you're treating them. So that's why personally I would focus on compressions, shocks, and not the airway, but that's what EMS medical directors are going to have to decide. And then um, to go back to, in just in the last few minutes, um, our last ACE inhibitor question. If a patient asks for ACE inhibitors, oh, interesting. So your patients are coming in and asking you for ACE inhibitors with a positive COVID result but mild symptoms. Don't prescribe. Yeah, do not prescribe it. It's not, we don't have any evidence that it's beneficial. Uh, we don't know the pathophysiology there. And we, even if we don't, even if changing the ACE receptor density, we don't know if that does anything. Um, so that's interesting. Uh, Jonathan, I'm interested. Can you tell me more about your patients asking for ACE inhibitors? What's that like? You can unmute and tell us if you're able to. Um, it's a few patients who used to be on multiple different medications and uh, they said they wanted to revert back to the ACE inhibitors. So it was just one of those things where I guess it was their like preferential uh, experiences from the past and they just wanted it. Um, yeah. So they wanted it for their hypertension, not because of their COVID-19 positive result or... Right, because, right, Okay. Right. Yeah. So in that setting, if they're not positive for COVID-19, I would just say that's fine if they have a patient preference to go back. But if someone is COVID positive, I would wait and um, not change the ACE inhibitor regimen until after they're through active infection. And same with uh, azithromycin and the hydrochloroquine? Yeah, you know, personally, I would be reluctant to prescribe those on an outpatient basis at this point because the benefit is so unknown and the potential risk, particularly for my patients, you know, obviously all my patients are cardiac patients. I would reserve that for ICU setting. Um, 
Um, I think we're going to get more guidance on that hopefully shortly. Um, but I, at this point, I don't think the evidence supports giving it particularly to people who are mildly symptomatic. Okay, great. Um, I think there might be one more slide and then we're re reaching the top of the hour. Um, what do I have? Okay. Um, I was going to have a discussion, but you, that was there in case we didn't have enough discussion during the time. So I'm grateful and I think we're at the top of the hour.